afternoon. Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. You know, this is a very exciting moment here for ranked choice voting, you know, which we all believe uh, in and know that it's the fastest growing election reform in the country. You know, it's in over 50 jurisdictions with nearly, nearly 10 million voters. And now I wanna say I appreciate everyone for spending this hour uh, to talk with us and about this important reform. You know, in this webinar series, we've spoken to some of the greatest thinkers in the electoral reform space about how we create the kind of democracy that can live up to our highest ideals and deliver the leadership we need during this especially challenging moment. If you're interested, uh, you can find out our previous webinar recordings on the Fair Vote YouTube channel. Uh, we'll make sure there's a link or put that in the chat for later on. Um, my name is Colette Pitts. I'm the Executive Vice President for Policy and Programs at Ranked Choice Voting here at Fair Vote. And it is my first webinar hosting uh, a, a panel. So I'm excited to be, particularly to be with these three gentlemen who have been crucial, three, th two gentlemen and one, uh, one woman, uh, three women, sorry, three gentlemen and, and one woman um, uh, because they have been crucial uh, in moving ranked choice voting uh, this year. Uh, today we'll hear from local election reform leaders on the success of ranked choice voting in Utah, Virginia, and the Big Apple itself, New York City, and how ranked choice voting could be coming to our nation's capital. But first, I wanna share a little bit more about how the ranked choice voting movement and the community here that we're all present in, has a, what they have accomplished in 2021. You know, this past year, a record 32 cities successfully used RCV on election day across seven states, which are Utah, um, Delaware, May, uh, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, and New Mexico. 22 cities successfully used ranked choice voting for the first time on election day. And ranked choice voting went from five for five in city ballot measures approved by voters in Broomfield, Colorado, Westbrook, Maine, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Austin, Texas, and Burlington, Vermont. Burlington is very sweet because it had passed before and it was repealed and was brought back again. So uh, uh, much kudos to the folks in, in Vermont and Burlington for getting that done. New York City used ranked choice voting for the first time and elected its second black mayor in the city's history and its first majority female city council, as well as its first South Asian American, Muslim woman and black gay woman council members. In Minneapolis and Salt Lake City also elected a city councils made up of representatives of color for the very first time in their voting history. And in Virginia, Republicans successfully nominated their governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general, a trifecta there, uh, their candidates using a ranked choice voting in their, in, in, in their selection process. This is just a short summary of the progress we are seeing for ranked choice voting. And there is so much more to do and to discuss today with our guests. I'm gonna introduce them in one moment, but before I do, I wanna encourage all of you who, <clears throat> excuse me, who've joined us to be involved in our discussion. If you have questions you would like to ask at any point during the conversation, please use our Q&A and the chat functions below. Our Fair Vote team will monitor those fields throughout the conversation. Now, let me introduce our panelists. First off is Sean Dugar. Sean is a political and nonprofit consultant with two decades of experience. He's managed over a dozen candidates and issue campaigns on important topics like police accountability, uh, expanded access to the ballot box, and now ranked choice voting. Currently, Sean is leading the More Voice DC campaign to bring ranked choice voting to our nation's capital. And there's Susan Lerner, uh, an old friend to the, and well-known to the ranked choice voting community. Susan is the executive director of Common Cause New York, where she has served since December of 2007, passionate about voting rights and, and, and accessible, reliable, and secure elections. Susan is a founder of the Let New York Vote, a statewide, sorry for that, a statewide coalition that has successfully advocated to bring transformative election reforms such as early voting and automatic voter registration to New York State. She heads Ranked Choice Voting in New York uh, City with its, uh, uh, which is conducting a citywide voter registration campaign following its successful, its success, sorry, in placing and, and passing Ranked Choice Voting on the November 2019 New York City ballot. Eric Wilson is a Virginia-based political technologist driving innovation and digital transformation. He's a veteran of numerous campaigns, including Marco Rubio's 2016 campaign for president and Ed Gillespie's campaign for Virginia governor in 2017. Eric is a managing partner at Startup Caucus, 
and an investment fund and start and startup accelerator for Republican campaign technology. And last but not least, there is Stan Lockhart. He's the chair of Utah Ranked Choice Voting. Stan has worked in all in the technology field for over 30 years and served for decades in the Utah Republican Party's Central Committee. He's a recipient of the prodigious Ronald Reagan Award for his service in the Republican Party, and he has served in virtually every grassroots position, including chairman of the Utah Republican Party. So with that, I want to start off with questions. So let's welcome, let's, so everyone welcome, and let's get started. So I'm going to start with Stan. Stan, I'd like to start with you and ask you this. You've been a leader in moving RCV forward in Utah, and you know, Utah is now a state that uses RCV in more cities than any other state in the country. Tell us about how that came to be and where cities in Utah were given the option, given the option to try RCV. Yeah, I'll try to give you the Cliff Notes version here. Um, thanks for having me, Colin. Um, so in the mid nineties, uh, Republican conservative grassroots activists brought ranked choice voting to the Republican party. They wanted to use it in our conventions. And uh, I was a part of the establishment. So whatever they were for, I was against. And, um, and they just kept pounding away and, as much, and I kept battling back. And I think anybody who's introduced to ranked choice voting the first time, they're a bit skeptical. I know how to game the other system. I don't know much about this one. And so there's just this natural skepticism that, that you start off with. But over time, they persuaded uh, the delegates to use uh, ranked choice voting in Republican conventions in Utah. And over time, I saw our convention times go from 10, 11 hours to three to four hours. And I said, hey, maybe this isn't so bad after all. Uh, after a few years, um, legislation kept coming. These, these grassroots activists kept asking legislators to run bills. And year after year, we would have uh, people running bills in the legislature to use ranked choice voting with very little movement. Until 2017, when the most conservative, well, arguably the most conservative legislator in our state house and the most liberal legislator in our state house co-sponsored a bill to do ranked choice voting in partisan elections, and it overwhelmingly passed the House of Representatives in Utah. It went over to the Senate where it stalled on a three to three vote in a Senate committee. And so that's when I started getting more involved. The ranked choice voting people came to me and said, Stan, will you help us? And by this time, I was convinced that it was a good, a good option, and so I began helping. We went to each senator and we started asking them questions about their feelings around ranked choice voting. And the primary objection was just this natural skepticism that you have when you haven't used it before, uh, in this case, in a public election. So as we talked to them about what would make them comfortable, they said, if we could get data on how Utah voters respond to ranked choice voting, we might be willing to uh, vote in favor of using it in partisan elections. So in 2018, we did a local options bill. We call it a pilot project. It's a pilot alternative elections options for cities that give them the opportunity to proactively opt in to ranked choice voting. It passed overwhelmingly in the House and overwhelmingly in the Senate. And we have eight years to prove out ranked choice voting in Utah. So the first year, 2019, we had two cities opt in. And those cities had an excellent experience with over 80% of their voters not only liking ranked choice voting, but wanting to use it again. Both of those cities opted in for 2021. And then somewhat surprisingly, frankly, another 21 cities opted in. We had 23 cities and in not all of those cities did they have the opportunity to use ranked choice voting because they didn't have enough candidates. But in roughly 20 of those cities, ranked choice voting was used. And um, we're continuing to work together with the legislature to figure out what, what the results from this election means. We had over 250,000 registered voters affected by this, over 100,000 actually voted. And, um, and then we, we've done some deep dives into figuring out the voter experience and how, it, and how it went. We'll talk about that later, but long story short, we're having a very successful experience using ranked choice voting in Utah. And our goal is to get it used in partisan elections. Well, those 21 additional cities didn't, didn't just happen to happen to chance. I know it's hard work that you and your team uh, and, and others in the, in, the, in, the, in the state did to make that happen. Uh, so congratulations on, on that. Um, Sean, you know, you've been working in RCV in California and New York and, and now in DC, the Chocolate City. 
you know the reform well. So can you tell us what you like the most about this reform and how it impacts the places that have used it? And, and just a second follow-up to that, and how do you think it will have a positive impact here on uh, residents here in Washington, D.C.? Sure, thank you, Colin. Um, and thank you to the Fair Boat team for this invite. Um, I have been a ranked choice vote, voter for over a decade now. And I have seen firsthand its ability to allow um, voters, but especially voters of color, to coalesce around candidates and continue to have representation in places where under the traditional system they may not or may no longer have. Um, so I always use San Francisco as an example. San Francisco, a city that now only has a 5% Black population, um, has, its, has elected and re-elected its first Black woman as mayor. Um, and that's because uh, the issues that she talks about, the issues that often Black candidates and candidates of color and women talk about are universal issues. They're talking about healthcare, they're talking about housing, they're talking about jobs. And those, that message resonates well beyond um, what would traditionally be their base. Here, you know, we saw it in New York. We saw, and I know Susan's gonna talk about it, but the city go from never having elected more than 15 women up to its 51 person city council to in a single election electing 31 and having an overwhelming uh, majority female city council. Uh, and that kind of plays here into DC. DC is a place where, yes, it's chocolate city, uh, but it's gone from a dark chocolate to kind of a milk chocolate um, in recent years. And so as the population shifts, there's a concern um, and a valid concern about longtime voters and residents being pushed out and their vote being diluted or concerns now that the maps have been approved that districts are drastically changing and it makes it harder for candidates um, a for incumbents but b for candidates who represent certain communities to be elected and re-elected um, sorry for the changing light the sun is going through clouds right now um, but we're seeing you know, that concern playing out. And so ranked choice voting, I know from personal experience is a good solution and really will be impactful in ensuring that uh, those people who make up the heart and soul of DC continue to be represented in elected office. Thanks, uh, thanks Sean. As when he, when he talks about from personal experience, Sean uh, resides in Oakland, California which has been using ranked choice voting, uh, it has transformed that city council and, and their representation in, in, that, in, in, the, in that city. You know, we've heard a little bit about what's, you know, what's in Utah and Sean talked a little bit about happening in New York up 95. And before we go to Susan and talk a little bit more about that, we'll go across the Potomac River from DC to uh, Virginia and talk with Eric. You know, Eric, you, uh, you approach RCV through not only a conservative lens, uh, but through an improving process with the innovation and technology. What is it about RCV that appeals to you? Well, I think if we go through the trouble of having these really big elections and mobilizing people and the investments we make, we need to have good, reliable data on what the outcomes are. And so under a traditional first-past-the-post method, uh, you're getting a one or a zero. You don't know if it was a vote for an agenda or against an agenda. Uh, and so... I. Ranked choice voting gives us the opportunity to get more sophisticated data, more layers of, you know, what, what parts of an agenda does do, do voters respond to? Um, all the things that Sean uh, mentioned of, of sort of increasing representation, it gives us a little bit more sophisticated outlook uh, on what the electorate is saying. I mean, I think we um, uh, have lots of complex issues being debated, whether that's in parties specifically or uh, in, in elections generally. And, and I think they deserve more feedback from the public than a, a one or a zero. And so from, from that perspective, I really believe that 
uh, ranked choice voting is an important mechanism to innovate. Uh, and so obviously lots of great success stories here, but uh, it, it opens the door for more focused agenda-driven campaigns that aren't simply about uh, attacking or going negative on an opposing candidate. So if you've got to win, a, if, if you've not, not just win, but really earn a majority of voters, you've got to talk about issues. You've got to be for something. It's not just uh, about pushing the other person down uh, as far as you can, as fast as you can. And so I, I think it's a really important reform to get our campaigns back to policy issues, positive visions. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, I hope, but uh, more, uh, I don't know if I say kinder campaigns, but campaigns that certainly have an eye towards building uh, consensus and rather than just sort of getting to 30 or 40 percent of the electorate, getting to a 50 percent plus one. Uh, we saw some some really great effects on that here in Virginia with a, a really unified party coming out of, of the, the ranked choice convention. So that's why I'm excited about ranked choice voting is it is it allows voters single action to give us a lot more data and feedback uh, and, and is frankly more sophisticated than just a one or a zero in a traditional election. Thanks, Eric. I know I heard from some of the election administrators in Utah. Uh, I was on a panel oh, uh, early, late last year and described she described it as quicker, faster, cheaper. Right. Um, so uh, I think that was a motto in, 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 uh, in Utah. Well, um, and, and, and in Virginia, right, we, we, we were home to this way before my time, the largest indoor gathering of, of democracy uh, was the convention that nominated Dick Obenshane over Mark Warner. Um, but unfortunately, Dick Obenshane uh, died in a plane crash um, a, a week later, and then John Warner went on to become senator. Uh, conventions have been happening a long time in Virginia. Uh, they go all night long. Uh, they're, they're really uh, difficult for people to participate in. And so a reform like ranked choice voting can help uh, get more people involved. Involved, yeah. Well, speaking of involved, you just, a nice segue. I don't know if there was another single person who was more responsible and more involved in the implementation of, in the election of ranked choice voting in, uh, in New York, you know, the biggest city in the country with over 8 million people, five boroughs, you know, Susan, they use ranked choice voting for the very first time. Um, the result is the most diverse, the result is like, the, as Sean talked about, the most diverse city council in city's history. What is it about RCV that has improved the diversity of the city council? And then second, um, what did New York voters and candidates think of using RCV for the first time? Kali, thank you so much. Uh, for those excellent lead-in questions. And thanks to the Fair Vote team for pulling together this, this discussion on the impact that ranked choice voting can have in so many different places. I do wanna let attendees know that next Wednesday, as part of our uh, Blueprint for a Greater Democracy series, we're gonna dig into how you actually get to RCV, um, hearing from some folks who have the experience of trying to pass it and implement it on the ground. So if you want more details on that, send me an email and the Fair Vote team after this seminar will have the information about that conference. It's a half day conference. Um, you know, Eric talked about some of the things that happen with RCV, some of the things that are attractive about RCV. And I think we definitely saw that in New York and the candidates who took advantage and understood the strength of the system, frankly, were a lot of the women candidates who formed alliances among themselves with other candidates, male, female, binary, whatever, trans, um, and who were willing to invest in RCV and it paid off. It paid off for such a diverse city council that we're really excited to be working with uh, in the coming session. So a majority women candidate, the first Muslim candidates, South Asian, uh, rather Muslim council member, South Asian council member. New York is very diverse and its politics have been trending to greater diversity, but it was really RCV 
that put it over the top. And it really was the time and attention to educating the candidates and the candidates who embraced RCB, who were most successful, certainly at the city council level. Um, and RCB is just um, really popular in New York City. Our experience with exit polling is very similar to the exit poll results that we saw in other cities and jurisdictions that have adopted RCV, if anything, perhaps a little bit stronger. Um, we have 85% of New York voters uh, who ranked at least two candidates on their ballot in the mayoral primary. 71% of voters ranked at least two candidates for the city council primary. And remember, we used it in our primary, not in the general. And I can go into that another time about why. But the real action in New York City is in the primaries. New Yorkers understood the promise, the power of ranked choice voting. 53% told us they ranked it because it allowed them to support multiple candidates. 47% ranked because it allowed them to vote their values. 45% ranked because it gave them more of a say in who gets elected. And 94% of New York City primary voters found their ballots were simple to complete. And virtually 80% of New York voters said they understood ranked choice voting extremely or very well. And about three quarters of them who approved it for the local elections in 2019, more than that level, 77% said they wanted to continue to use it in New York City elections. So the years long education campaign, and I wanna thank Sean who was such an integral part of helping address the challenge of educating millions of New York City voters in multiple languages, that campaign paid off. People understood it, people used it, people like it, and that allows us to look forward to strengthening ranked choice voting for future New York City primaries and ultimately probably general elections in the city. And who knows what will happen at the New York state level. Well, it's great, Susan, as, as you said, talked about, you know, it sets because of the great work that you and Sean and others have done um, in terms of the experience people had there, it does strengthen the case of how we expanded uh, in the city and hopefully maybe in New York State very, fairly soon. So you've talked about polling in New York. I know Stan, um, you know, uh, Y2 Analytics uh, conducted a poll of Utah voters who use RCV voting. Can you tell us a little bit about those findings and what do you think they hold for the future of ranked choice voting in the state of Utah? Thank you. Um, one of the things we wanted to do was find out the voter experience. Uh, to me, that's the great promise of ranked choice voting, that voters can more fully express their will and have a better experience at the polls. That hopefully motivates them to go to the polls and also motivates them to uh, figure out how to rank by doing a little bit more research on candidates and, and getting more involved. And we want more involvement in our elections. And so, um, so we brought in this very respected polling uh, company, and here are just a few of the things that they found. Um, number one, 90% of the voters thought that ranked choice voting, the instructions were easy to read, easy to, to, uh, to navigate. Um, uh, rough 81% uh, thought it was very easy to use. Um, so uh, one of the, one of the uh, knocks on ranked choice voting is that voters can't figure it out, that for some reason it's too hard to, to ask them to rank and that it, it'll create voter confusion we hear sometimes. And those poll results with really, uh, this, this polling firm had a margin of error of 2.6%. If you understand polling, that is uh, a very, very low margin of error. And so we have great certainty that voters understood how to use ranked choice voting and, um, and, and they, they found it easy to use, easy to figure out. The second thing that we asked them, the second kinds of questions that we asked them was, did you like it? And would you like to expand it? And we, uh, two years ago, when we had two cities using it, 84% of voters liked it and wanted to use it again. This time we had 62% who liked using ranked choice voting and wanted to use it again. And the reason for that drop is that two years ago, we didn't have organized opposition. I mean, who's gonna, who's gonna come out and campaign against using ranked choice voting? It makes no sense to me. But this year, because we had a large number of cities using it, 
there were concentrated efforts to not only persuade voters that they didn't like ranked choice voting, but also to persuade them to disenfranchise themselves by only voting for one candidate in a ranked choice voting election. I found that fascinating. It actually affected the election results in at least one city that we had because the opposition was so uh, uh, forceful in their, in their advocacy against it. But even with that, we still had over 60%, 62% actually, who liked the, the ranked choice voting experience and wanted to do it again. And over 50% of those voters wanted to expand it and use it in other elections. And we found for a first time use and for voters who had just used it for the very first time, those were very promising results. Well, I think you've seen, thanks Dan, in, in both in the cities in Utah and New York, a very positive you know, voter experience. Uh, and that didn't just come by half and chance, that came through education. One of the things I could like say is an educated voter is an engaged voter. Um, Susan, um, can you um, uh, share with us uh, a little bit more about the education program in New York? Um, you know, it's very important, successful implementation of ranked choice voting. Um, um, obviously, incredibly diverse city where voters speak many different languages. How did you pull that off? Well, first of all, I'm the person who said after we translated into the 13th language that we had done enough language translation. <laughs> Sean grins because he was trying to get me up to 16. And I was like, OK, I'm sorry, Albanian voters be angry at me, but enough. Um, we translated into 13 different languages. We ensured that we had large print versions for all of our languages and that all of our materials were in large print. We did special outreach to seniors. Um, we uh, partnered with social service agencies, including the Food Bank and Meals on Wheels, to be sure that homebound voters had material about ranked choice voting. And we worked from the very beginning with a broad coalition of groups. Um, to be sure that we had community partners who were trusted messengers in the communities so that voters heard from the right messengers about ranked choice voting, about the details. Um, we did literally hundreds and hundreds of online presentations. Some of them were workshops that we pulled together. Many of them were presentations or workshops um, that we did with partners, including elected officials who asked us to do town halls. Um, we had a website that had an interaction, interactive ballot uh, so that people could practice. Uh, thanks to Sean, we had a wonderful mobily accessible uh, ranked choice voting contest app um, that we were able to ask people to rank their, who they thought was the uh, most outstanding civil rights proponent in the black community in New York. We did a Women's History Month where we asked people to rank their choices for the most outstanding uh, woman uh, representing New York. Um, and we're able to set up contests that were specific to our partners and their communities to really engage people, give them the opportunity of working with ranked choice voting because we found that bar none, the best tool was visual, was either the animation that showed people how ranked choice voting worked, or it was an actual sample ballot, which nine times out of 10, if you put it in the hands of a voter, there's an aha moment. They go from, what are you talking about to, oh, I get it. Um, and so uh, the message and the graphics, the actual presentation, uh, we found we paid attention to that. We worked with experts on making it clear and simple and uniform. And um, that's how we did it. Well, this call and the presentations, you know, highlight a number of firsts. The first time New York City was using ranked choice voting, the first time that uh, Utah was expanding it uh, really across the, across the state. Um, mm -hmm. But there was a, another first that really flew under the radar a bit. And that's experience in Virginia. You know, Eric, Virginia just elected actually its first Republican candidate in statewide office since 2009. Can you talk to us a little bit about the ranked choice voting convention and what role you think ranked choice voting played in creating such a strong ticket? Well, 
we were faced with, uh, you know, a very competitive field of, um, of candidates uh, at both the top of the ticket. So for the gubernatorial contest, you had, uh, of course, Glenn Youngkin, who ultimately won. You had uh, Kirk Cox, who was the Speaker of the House. You had Pete Snyder, who's been involved in uh, Virginia for, for a long time, and then a number of other candidates. And so we looked at this of saying, look, if we if we um, turn it over to a, a primary, um, which the just a little bit of background for people to understand here. So in Virginia, the state law gives it to the parties to decide. You can choose um, any sort of party run method of nomination. Typically, that's a convention. Sometimes that's a, a, what we call a firehouse primary or a, a canvas and uh, or a sort of state run primary uh, process. We decided to go with uh, the the what we called an unassembled convention. Uh, so it's sort of the, the convention mechanism that we were used to, but because of the ongoing pandemic and restrictions about gatherings, uh, we did it in a way that was distributed and um, could allow for sort of drive-through voting and things like that. So uh, what ended up happening is, is you had... Um, the party come out of that process very unified. Uh, and, and what's more, because we made it accessible in, in more than three dozen different locations around the Commonwealth, lots of people got to participate. Previously, you know, you might have 10,000 people show up at a convention and not necessarily all of them will, will stay to the end. In this case, uh, turnout was in uh, nearly 50,000 voters, I think, um, across the Commonwealth. And so we had a unified party, which was critical to our, our success. And, and to add to that historic accomplishment, we elected the, for the first time uh, African-American woman statewide in Virginia with Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears. Uh, and then Jason Miares is a, uh, our attorney general elect, and he is a Latino. So it, was, it created a very diverse ticket. Um, and I think that helped with our uh, with our victory in in Virginia, and uh, I think it was it was a really good opportunity to sort of say, okay, let's. It, it in in the past, what has really held us back from winning statewide in Virginia, is all of the negative campaigning that goes on to make sure that you damage your opponent. In this case, that was not a smart move because you needed those people's uh, supporters. And so we came out with a much more stronger and unified party. Uh, I'm going to take the prerogative of the moderator to ask you a follow-up, but it won't be my follow-up uh, as I'm monitoring the chat and seeing questions as we get to the sort of more open session. I, it was something that I saw from Alan Smith, that sort of dove cell we were just talking about. And I'll read your question, Alan. He said, I see this as a huge shift or change in party politics. Normally a few party regulars pick a candidate in a primary then the party will promote their party's candidate. Um, how do, do the party support two or more candidates? Yeah, so I, I think that that's the distinction between is this a, a nomination effort, right? Uh, which is where I, I think our, our, you know, the, the success in getting RCV into more places is gonna be on the, the partisan nomination side of things uh, before we get to a full, um, you know, general election RCV. So I think in, in that case, you know, you whoever runs the best campaign is going to win. Uh, I, I think if we get to a stage in the United States where we have sort of more wide open ranked choice voting, it'll be much like uh, Australia, where I've been involved in campaigns there since 2016. Uh, and they employ ranked choice voting and, and the, the parties support their candidate. Um, that is selected by some sort of uh, party nominating process. Uh, and they may work out preference deals with other uh, parties. But I think, uh, so, so we've got a good model there in how you support multiple um, candidates, even though you're only gonna have one candidate from a, from a party uh, in, in that case. Thanks, Eric. And you know, I asked, uh question from one of the local activists. And we've got a number of them on the phone here or the video call with us. Um, you know, Sean, you have a lot of local activists and campaign leaders, you know, on this call as I 
just indicated, can you share one piece of advice you've learned in your time leading RCV campaigns and education efforts? Sure. Um, actually, it's a two-parter, but they circle around each other. And I think that is how you interact with the community matters and when you interact with the community. Um, Susan said something earlier, she used a phrase, trusted messengers. And that's incredibly important. I think far too often in our reform movements, the folks who um, many communities are an afterthought and they generally become an obstacle in our path of education or advocacy. And that's because they rightfully so are not trusting of outsiders. So find people who have relationships in those communities, use them as trusted messengers. If you can't find someone, build a relationship, but build a relationship that is a two-way relationship. You're working with them on their issues long before you ask them to work on your issues. Um, this is the same that, you know, it's true in campaigning in any sense, but especially in our reform space, um, having those relationships and building those relationships up front can be a huge, um, can lift a huge weight in the back. I'll use San Diego as an example. Um, San Diego has a campaign that is underway now for RCV but they took the time to sit down with the Democratic Party in a county that is overwhelmingly Democratic and work out the RCV mechanisms with that party leadership so that they now don't have to face the main party in their area being in opposition to their initiative. Um, the same is true of communities of color, engaging communities of color on the front end as the proposal is being created, um, not on the back end after it's all been set in stone and is either in legislation or on the ballot. Thanks, Sean. Um, now we're gonna take a little shift in focus to open uh, some questions up and we did one already to, from our participants. Um, I'm gonna try to get to as many as I can. So for those of you who don't get to ask, I don't get that chance to ask the question to our guests, uh, we will either try to answer those questions live here in the chat, or we will answer them um, after this call is over. So I want to turn my first question to, to Susan uh, and, a, and a question from uh, Richard, Richard Casa. Um, you know, in New York, a lot of attention was in New York, um, both leading up to it and right after the election. And some of it um, uh, focused on the counting and maybe some administrative problems that were not related to RCV. No. Um, so could you talk and do a little education sure. for folks here, uh, describe the administrative troubles with RCV in, the, in this so, last election? Uh, I think people may be aware that the New York City Board of, Edu of Elections has a less than sterling reputation for election administration. And that of course was something that came up throughout the process. We spent a lot of time working very directly with the board, very quietly behind the scenes to build trust and to introduce them to RCV. Um, and they told us that in 20, at the end of 2019, when RCV passed, they thought their biggest challenge for 2020 was going to be figuring out how to implement RCV. And then the pandemic hit <laughs> and they realized that implementing RCV was actually a lot simpler than the process of having to cope with a worldwide pandemic and all of the changes that happened in New York's election law as a consequence. Everything was going along extremely well. Um, we even had a special, some special elections where for various reasons they did hand counts and that turned out to be a blessing in disguise because people got to see very directly how the votes were counted and transferred. And it answered a lot of questions that people in the political class had, but everything was going along very well. We have these great exit poll results. New York has an attenuated process in counting their absentee ballots. That has nothing to do with RCV. It means that the certified results are not available anywhere from three to five weeks until three to five weeks after the uh, election day. And uh, the board got a lot of pressure, not from us, but from others, to release interim results. 
And in the first set of interim results, which they released, one individual in one borough uh, failed to clear the testing ballots that had been put in to be sure that the system was working. And as a consequence, the unofficial first round of tabulations had about 130 x 130,000 more votes than the actual number of people who voted on early and election day. And they didn't catch it before they put these unofficial results out. Of course, a consultant and the press caught it within 15 minutes. They pulled everything back, they backtracked, and they realized that what happened was that they hadn't cleared the uh, images of the, of the test ballots, that they always run test ballots, and they forgot to clear the images. They announced what had happened, but by that time the cat was out of the bag, a lot of confusion, and they were very straightforward in saying this was human error that had nothing to do with ranked choice voting, that it wasn't a ranked choice voting procedure. Um, that was the problem, that ranked choice voting worked very, very well, but by that time, there already were headlines that there had been a mess up. Um, so our big challenge in New York City is Board of Elections reform, not ranked choice voting. Thanks, Susan, for clearing that up. And you know, we worked hard with you and others to make sure that some misinformation was cleared up and uh, some of the spin that was done to sort of relate the problems, at least the assumed problems of this reporting of the election were not uh, tagged onto our CV. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question from Ron Randall, um, ask, I'm presenting to the group, but I'm going to ask Stan to maybe address this because I think this fits him uh, when we get to the question. Um, Ron asks, were all the uses of RCV discussed today within single party, closed primaries, or were some used in general elections? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. Um, and. Uh, in our case, with our municipal elections, uh, we had two kinds of elect. First of all, all cities chose to bypass a primary and go directly to a general election. They had the option of doing ranked choice voting in a primary if they desired, but all 23 chose to save some money uh, because those primaries actually cost about one half of the, of, of the entire election budget because it's based on registered voters and not on how many vote. Um, so they all chose to, to go directly to a general election for the uh, for ranked choice voting. There were two kinds of elections. One was a single winner election and the other was a multi winner election. I think about two thirds to three fourths of the elections were single winner and uh, the rest were were multi winner elections. So the but the point of the question is there are different kinds of elections that uh, ranked choice voting can work very well in. And, uh, and everybody kind of has a little bit different spin. You know, Virginia's process is a little bit different than Utah's process for nominating candidates in a partisan uh, process. So, um, so yeah, ranked choice voting works very well in, a, in, a, in a, a, a diverse number of ways to elect candidates. Thanks, Stan. This is a sort of a, Continuation. Of, we've, we've seen ranked choice voting feel prominent, obviously in New York in New York City this year, and a heavily Democratic city. But of course, we have two prime examples of of how the nonpartisanness of ranked choice voting is makes it so much it's so popular. Um, so, Stan, this question is for Stan and Eric. This question is from Elizabeth Nelson. Um, what are your suggestions for advocating for RCV in rural conservative districts that are aren't necessarily highly competitive, what would be compelling reason for a, for a locality to adopt RCV? Yeah, in, in, rural, in rural areas, I think the best argument for ranked choice voting is that many times they struggle to find even two candidates to run. Um, there's sometimes they, they struggle to find one candidate in rural parts of, of uh, Utah. And I'm guessing it's the same in every state. And so when you're struggling to find candidates, you might end up with an election where only one of your races has more than two candidates. Well, why in the world are you going to have a primary um, in, in, that, in that circumstance? It makes so much more sense when you have a small number of candidates or a small pool of candidates to choose from 
that you would use ranked choice voting and default to a general election because it truly saves so much hassle that might only be uh, justified because one additional person filed. So I think that's the best way. Now, the second part of that question has to do with a conservative uh, area. And I think that that might be something we should talk about. So conservatives by nature are traditionalists. Progressives by nature are more open to change. And I think we just need to start from that place when we look at ranked choice voting, because that is because ranked choice voting is a change. And so the way to appeal to uh, conservatives and traditionalists is really to go back to the intent of the form of government that we have. And I always go back to the Constitutional Convention and to our founders and to their writings. And what they wanted was they, want, they viewed this, the election as the single most important part of our, uh, of our government. And, and so in this day and age of apathy, they wanted engagement. And they didn't want just anybody voting, frankly. They wanted, they wanted voters who were knowledgeable and who were willing to dig in a little bit deeper. Well, ranked choice voting has incentive to do that. And so I really believe that ranked choice voting more fully articulates what our founders had in mind. And that's the argument I think that is most persuasive in conservative circles. Two things I'd add to that uh, from a conservative uh, perspective and even a, a rural perspective is that it first it allows you to go to the electorate in a, essentially like a, a binding poll. So it, it could allow someone, a candidate, to surface an issue that might be getting ignored by establishment candidates. You know whether that is a uh, uh, well, it was a very important local issue or an important statewide issue, but allowing you know candidates to to sort of represent that position can show the ultimate winner how popular um, the policy is or, or the approach is. The second thing, um, uh, former New York mayoral candidate, William F. Buckley uh, had his rule about Republican primaries, the most conservative um, candidate who can get elected. And RCV is, is actually the mechanism to do that. So, you know, it, you, can, you can have your debate over who is who is going to be the the most conservative voice in a in a primary or a general election? And it's not no one's playing spoiler. No one's um, uh, taking away from another another candidate. And so I think those are two other things that I would would add. Thanks, Eric and, and Stan. And Sean, just this question I think is most directed towards you. The best to answer. Um, a little longer. How would one answer critics of RCV who claim it leads to Milk toast candidates, though on the one hand, as everyone fears of offending any one block of voters, and it hurts the poor and minorities on the other who don't have as much time and resources to access the extra information needed to decide on so many candidates. Well, I think if you talk to the average voter, they have a position on a good number of candidates in a race. Um, in any race. And I know the Center for Civic Design actually has done quite a bit of research about this and has it on their website. Um, but when they polled voters, when they did survey groups and study groups, they found that on average, no matter how large the pool is, voters have strong feelings on three to six candidates. Um, which is why most RCV efforts at this point land in the realm of rank your five favorites, um, as is the case in New York, as will be the case in DC. Um, so that's number one. Number two is, I wouldn't quite say milk toast. I think that was the phrase. Um, it's, it gives you candidates who have mass appeal who are able to build those broad coalitions. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, quite often for candidates of color, those broad coalitions come naturally because they speak to issues that transcend um, party, that transcend race, that transcend economic status. You know, when you're talking about pocketbook issues, you are able to reach a much broader range of folks and that gets you elected. And we've seen strong leaders elected across the board under ranked choice voting. Again, whether it is the first two 
Black LGBT women elected to office in New York, whether it is, you know, super progressive Black candidates in Oakland, um, as well as folks um, in other parts of the country who are really strong and have a presence in their community. Thanks, thanks, Sean. Um, this is an uh, open question to, to, to the panel. Um, and largely because you know, Stan talked about, you know, uh, RCV being implemented in Utah and then how it's different, how it was implemented and, and used in um, you know, Virginia. And I'm combining two questions here. Um, and I've lost the name on the first questionnaire, the first question person. So I, I won't acknowledge either one of them, but your questions are being blended together. Um, uh, but here's a question for the group. Um, Eric, maybe you want to take a, a stab at as our technologist here. Does RCV require all candidates to be ranked, you know, the top three candidates or as many or as few as a voter wants, as a voter wants to rank? And then second, um, is there any thought to the, the ideal number of, of, of candidates to be on the ballot for rankings that will, that will engage voters? So let me, let me start with a, a, a low tech answer this, that we used a lot in, in Virginia to communicate this with our activists who are very familiar with convention. You start out uh, bright and early on a Saturday morning at 11 a.m. You're ready to do your first ballot. Then you sit around and you wait for three hours while they all get counted, right? That's sort of the <laughs> how, how conventions have worked. If you leave before the second ballot takes place, that's like only marking your first candidate on a ranked choice vote. And so that's one of the things that we communicated uh, with, with our voters. So um, again, big asterisk here on the, the rules of how the election is being administered, but uh, your ballot is in play until you run out of options. There's no penalty for only marking one person. Uh, there was a candidate uh, in, in Virginia who said, just vote, uh, mark me number one in every slot. Okay, it doesn't work that way, but but uh, and it didn't work out for her. Uh, but the idea was um, there was some confusion about, well, um, I don't want someone else to get my vote. And and I think the the way we communicate this is uh, your second choice preference does not go to anyone until your first choice is gone. And so that image of it's like leaving the convention before a, a result has been determined was really helpful for us. Thanks. Any other folks have any thoughts on that? I'll jump in. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, so I, I wanted to say that uh, each jurisdiction chooses for itself uh, what the how the system will work, right? There are some jurisdictions that allow you to rank all of the candidates. We in New York decided not to do that when we had a uh, runoff where we had a special election with 13 candidates for public advocate. And we realized, or 17, and I realized I had no idea who my 12th and 13th choices were. Um, some cities go to a top three. Um, we chose the top five. It varies by jurisdiction, depending on what you think will make the most sense based on how many candidates historically come out for the races that are gonna be ranked choice voting races. We chose five over three because we tend to have very large fields, anywhere from six to 12 in our primaries. And the question of ballot exhaustion became this obsession on the part of our charter revision commission. And statistically, you're less likely to have ballot exhaustion if you have up to five choices than if you have only three. So that's why we went to five. And just from a technical aspect, because um, I know this question has been asked several other times, um, you can vote for just one candidate if you like under ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting does not force you to rank candidates more, or more than one candidate. However, what we said, what we said in New York and what we're saying here in DC is the more people that you rank on the ballot, the more backups you have the more uh, voice you have in the process in case that first choice of yours doesn't make it to the final two. 
right? It's the, the idea is to put the choice in the hands of the voter. And if it is the voter, not the candidate's choice to vote for only one, then that's up to the voter. Just a quick anecdote from my Australian experience here. If anyone wants to Google this, go look at the Australian Senate ballots. Um, they, they can actually be as tall as I am and I'm six feet tall um, because you, you are, they have so many candidates and you have the ability to rank every single one. I mean, it would take probably an hour um, to completely rank everything. Um, but if you do go down that path, you've got to fill out all of your bubbles. Otherwise there's a shortcut right at the top. Um, and so it's a really fascinating sort of uh, mm -hmm. reduction to absurdism um, on the, uh, <laughs> the the other spectrum of what Susan's talking about. Yeah. Let, let me add my two bits here. Um, so the promise of ranked choice voting is a fuller expression of voter will. And that is a very powerful yeah. concept, right? I, as a voter, when I walk in that booth, I can more fully express my will of who I want to represent me. And it's such a, in fact, if I, if I could tell you the underlying power of ranked choice voting, it is in that phrase, a fuller expression of my will as a voter. So we, we need to be careful about trying to limit that fuller expression of will. Although I don't disagree that when we get lots of candidates, it becomes increasingly difficult to figure out who to rank as you go down ballot. And many times, if you're sixth and seventh place or eighth and ninth place, end up being the final two in an election, and you haven't been intentional, then you can get bad outcomes as a result of that. So I've actually come around just a little bit to where I, I feel better about limiting numbers to maybe five, but I think it's really important that we understand that when you do that, you're putting limitations on that fuller expression of voter will. Thanks, panel. I'm gonna ask, and I know I wasn't able to get to everyone's questions, um, but I try to get as many as I could, but I'm going to ask, you know, one last question from Andrew, uh, Andrew Stein. Um, you know, Eric, you mentioned about that we are obviously we're, we're as more ranked choice voting elections go on, we're doing more research and studying about this, but how it can make maybe a more kinder election. <laughs> Let's just say that Eric asked, um, and this is going to be directed towards you, Susan, but please, everyone, I want you the opportunity to, to answer this because we've had different experiences um, and different links of experiencing ranked choice voting. Um, are there examples of positive campaigning from the New York mayoral primary or other RCV elections? And so since you've mentioned New York first, uh, Susan, um, I want to open up with you. So actually at the very last stages of our mayoral campaign, we had two candidates who decided to collaborate and to go out together and recommend that uh, the voters rank them one and two. And as a consequence, uh, one of those candidates was catapulted into the penultimate round, um, who you know had been gaining ground, uh, but was a late entrance. And uh, I would say that Catherine Garcia in the mayoral race got a definite bump up for uh, a choosing to go out with Andrew Yang uh, and urge voters to rank the two of them. Uh, and I think that made a, a, a substantial difference in her ranking. She ended up being the third choice. The uh, next to last round was um, Eric Adams, Maya Wiley and Catherine Garcia and Wiley just inched out Garcia and then Adams inched out Wiley. Um, but we definitely saw that in the mayor's race with those two candidates and it got a lot of attention. And we saw it in a lot of places with the city council races. Um, and we've got some great joint ads and joint flyers that uh, we had the benefit of. And that was amazing. When we started sharing some of the good ads from Oakland Sean uh, shared one particularly good one with us with uh, three female candidates extolling each other's virtues and strengths. Uh, it just made a tremendous impact and impression on people and made them want to adopt RCV all the more. Sean, do you want to add to that? Because I know you've experienced of all of us ranked choice voting the longest in Oakland. Yes, so I've also run ranked choice candidate campaigns. And I can tell you 
between experiences in San Francisco, Oakland, and New York, there's one word I've seen erased from campaigns under ranked choice voting, and that's opponent. You no longer hear people referring to their opponents. You hear them talking about their colleagues, their fellow candidates, in some cases, their comrades, but you do not hear that word because that word has a negative connotation to it, that we're fighting against each other as opposed to us having shared values and shared positions and working together to make, to get into an office. And so, um, yes, I've seen time and time again, there is a video I often share that Susan mentioned. Um, if you Google Oakland District 4 Women's Slate, um, there is a wonderful video of three women candidates saying very nice things about each other and encouraging voters to rank them as their top three choices on the ballot. San or Eric, do you have anything to, you wanted to add to that? I'll just quickly give a shout out to Kirk Cox, former Speaker of the House of Delegates in Virginia, who did a really good job being uh, positive and uh, recorded a video where he said a nice thing about every single one of his opponents. Um, so we did see that, but I can testify from my mailbox, it was a very <laughs> nasty campaign uh, uh, and, and negative. Uh, so I think one of the, just as, as a note, the first time when it's brand new, it, it, you're, you're trying to educate voters and try to run a standard playbook. I think in subsequent elections is when you, when you start to see some of these side benefits. Stan, anything or not? <laughs> well, I, so the promise of civility is there. In other words, the incentive is there for candidates to be civil towards each other. Instead of the politics of personal destruction, let's talk about issues issues and not just your issues, but your opponent's issues when typically win the day for ranked choice voting candidates. But um, I, here's what I've discovered. Candidate behavior is really scattered. It's, it's really not consistent. And so there are candidates who truly embrace ranked choice voting and, and do some of this collaboration. There are others that are every bit as negative as they've been in the past, but their chances of being elected go down. So what, what I think we find is that fewer polarizing candidates get elected. And so those that, that go into attack mode don't do quite as well under ranked choice voting. So the incentives are there, but the behavior isn't, doesn't always match the incentives. Thanks. Colin, can I just jump in really yeah. quickly? Please do. Um, and I will say both in New York and in the Bay Area, there was a significant amount of candidate education done. Mm -hmm. In New York, there was an entire year's worth of education of candidates. Uh, Common Cause New York and Rank the Vote New York City created a nine hour candidate boot camp and trained over 200 campaigns over the course of a year on how to run under ranked choice voting. Um, similarly, something was done, the, a similar training was done for political parties and for endorsing organizations and for political staffers so that everyone had the training on how to campaign under ranked choice voting. And I think that had an incredible impact. So, you know, we can't just put it out there and say, we hope that it'll create uh, more positive campaigning. I think we also have to back it up and provide the support and resources um, to candidates and campaigns um, and that, off, that was offered universally to everyone. So it wasn't, you know, picking one candidate over another. Um, but I think that's key to making campaigns nicer and more fair. More fair. Well, I'll take this opportunity. Thank, thank you all to make a shameless plug. You know, Sean uh, uh, talked about, um, you know, him running RCV campaigns and candidate education. I know... Fair Vote is going to be working with Sean and others about putting together a candidate guide and seeing how we can do uh, more about educating not only candidates, um, but those political operatives who are running campaigns so they can see how their candidate can win in a, fair, in a, in a ranked choice voting election and win in a, maybe like Eric said, in a kinder, gentler, gentler manner. Um, well, I want to thank our guests, uh, you know, Eric Wilson, Sam Lockhart, Susan Lerner, and Sean Dugar for joining us today and thank all of you for 
um, for participating. Um, uh, this will be this post will be recorded on YouTube on our YouTube page by tomorrow. Um, one of the reasons why I asked Susan that particular question because I knew she was going to mention Andrew Yang. Um, <laughs> Um, and so in that, I hope you will join us next month on Thursday, January 13th at 4 p.m. for a conversation with said Andrew Yang, uh, the former presidential candidate, uh, and uh, uh, news to announce maybe for folks, a uh, Fair Vote Action board member. Uh, and he'll discuss his newly released book called Four Notes on the Future of Our Democracy. <coughs> Excuse me. So I wanna thank again our guests, particularly thank our participants, um, but more importantly, I want to wish everyone a very happy holidays. I hope you're with family, with friends, uh, and you stay safe. And uh, we all wish for a brighter and warmer 2022. So thank you all.